Hello, this is Bible Observations 101, and today we're going to be discussing a passage from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. And what we'll do is we're going to use the Tanakh, the Old Testament scriptures, to help explain the symbolism in these passages. So without further ado, let's begin with verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now, what we can see from this passage is that there are two primary symbols being used here, right? One is salt in verse 13. The other is light in verses 14 through 16. But before we proceed to explain these two symbols in light of what Jesus is saying, let's try to figure out and see who Jesus is speaking with. So let's go back up to the black letters, verses 1 and 2 of Matthew 5. When Jesus saw the crowds, and this is the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, or the hill, right? So Jesus is, remember, he's like the light, he's the lamp, he's going to be uh, giving his teaching on a hill, and he's going to talk about this idea of light and the hill. So that that's interesting, right? And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them. So there's some discussion whether he's directly talking to the disciples and the crowds, or if he's only talking to the disciples, right? Either way, what we do know is that in chapter 7 of Matthew, the crowds are listening because they respond with astonishment at Christ's teachings. So either way, the actually the important thing to note here is he's talking to Israel, okay? Just keep that in mind. He's talking to Israel. So let's go back to verse uh, 13, the idea of salt, right? Salt. So let's go to our first Old Testament passage to see what we can learn about salt. So Leviticus chapter 2, verse 13. Every grain offering of yours, moreover, you shall season with salt, so that the salt of the covenant of your God shall not be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. Now, this is concerning the priests who are mediating between God and the people, right? Who are basically uh, preparing these offerings, right? Now, the offerings are going to come from the people. Many of them will come from the people, right? The sons of Israel in general offer to the priests and the priests will dedicate it to God. Okay. So the salt here, what we can learn is that it's called the salt of the covenant of your God, right? So the salt has something to do with the law, the covenant God has made with Israel. Okay. Let's read another passage. Numbers chapter 18, verse 19. All the offerings of the holy, which the sons of Israel offer to the Lord. See, what this is exactly uh, going with what I said earlier. The sons of Israel offer to the Lord, right? I have given to you and your sons and your daughters with you as a perpetual allotment. So this is the priesthood. This is their allotment. So the sons of Israel will give the offerings to the priests, and the priests will offer it to God. And also they will get a portion for themselves to eat and such. And there's all these rules about that, right? It is an everlasting covenant of salt before the Lord to you and your descendants with you, the priesthood, right? He's going to be speaking to Aaron. Um, so uh, salt has to do with the covenant God made with Israel. Here's another passage about it when it comes to the kings, right? Second Chronicles chapter 13, verse 5. Do you not know that the Lord God of Israel gave the rule Mamlacha. The reason why I mention this Hebrew word is not to be fancy, but it's going to become important uh, later on, okay, when we talk about the salt of the earth, all right? So remember this word that I say here, Mamlacha, having to do with kingship, ruling, a king ruling, okay? Gave the rule over Israel forever to David, because David's a king, right? And his sons by a covenant of salt, right? So David and the ones who succeed on the throne of David, which will lead to Jesus, right? That's going to be important. All right. So let's go back and keep on reading this. You are the salt of the earth, verse 13, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty? 
It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. I want to focus on this part about being trampled underfoot by men, right? The salt that is tasteless, okay? And I'm going to do this by going to another passage in Leviticus, okay? Leviticus chapter 26, um, verse 17. This is concerning consequences for disobedience when Israel breaks the covenant, right? And the covenant is symbolized a lot of times by salt, okay? Verse 17, I will set my face against you so that you will be struck down before your enemies, and those who hate you will rule. See that word rule again? Remember what I said in the other passage? It was mamlacha. This is different. This is actually a verb form, but it's literally a completely different word, okay? Completely different word, whether it's a verb or a noun, okay? This one's a verb, but it's completely different than mamlacha, right? The idea of kingship. Those who hate you will rule over you, and you will flee when no one is pursuing you. The word uh, here is rada, completely different, and it conveys the meaning of treading, to tread. Okay, that's important, all right, because um, here it says when the salt becomes tasteless, it will be trampled, ooh, treaded, trampled underfoot by men. So, by who? By those who hate Israel. These are the nations. The Gentiles will rule over Israel. They will trample Israel down because of their disobedience to God, right? Um, the, the exile, uh, uh, you got Babylon, you got the Medes and the Persians, you have Greece, you have Rome. This is all because of Israel's disobedience, right? The nations will rule over God's people and tread them down. So, we can understand the idea of salt having to do with the covenant God made with Israel and the idea of Israel breaking that covenant and then being trampled underfoot by the Gentiles. This is what Jesus is conveying here as he's speaking in the black letters to Israel. Does that make sense? So now let's talk about the light. Okay, the light. So Matthew chapter 5 verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Jesus is talking about this while sitting on a hill. It's kind of funny. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, put on the lampstand. Uh, in Revelation, Jesus will be referred to as the lamp. I'll, we'll get to that in a sec. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So let's go to our first passage about this idea of light. Okay. Um, Isaiah chapter 60 glorified Zion. Uh, Jerusalem is actually set upon Zion, right? Zion is actually one of several hills in the area, but Jerusalem is also on Zion, the hill. So it says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. Let your light shine, right? Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the people's. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations, goyim, Gentiles, will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. See that? Let your light shine before men. So, really quick, this is talking about Zion, right? And, there, and the inhabitants of Zion is Israel, right? You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Jerusalem is set on Zion. What Jesus is talking about here in verse 14 is the city is Jerusalem, right? This is God's uh, shining city, not only for Israel, but to the nations, right? Um, Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under the basket, but on the lampstand, it gives light to all who are in the house. Now, remember we talked about David, this covenant of salt, uh, a man on the throne of David. Jesus is the king of Israel. He is the king who will rule in Jerusalem. He is the lamp. And he will rule in the city, right? And the nations will flock to it, right? The Gentiles. Let's go to another passage. First Kings chapter 15, verse 4. But for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem. Lamp, huh? To raise up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem. You see that? A lamp is being associated with son. A son of David right? To establish Jerusalem. This is the city set on a hill that cannot be hidden, right? Let's go to another passage. Psalm chapter 50. The mighty one, God the Lord, has spoken and summoned the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. 
out of Zion, the perfection of beauty God has shown forth. So, sitting on a hill that, hill that cannot be hidden, this is Jerusalem, right? The hill is Zion. The lamp is Christ. Who, who illuminates those who are within the house, right? Jesus is actually illuminating them right now on the hill, teaching. And he's telling them, let your light shine before men. They are representing the king. They are inhabitants of Jerusalem. They are to represent the Lord, right? So, let's go to a passage in Revelation, the New Jerusalem. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, right? Having the glory of God. So let's go down to verse 22. I saw no temple in it, that is the new Jerusalem, for the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb, being Jesus, are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations the Gentiles will walk by its light. You see that? See how this is just illuminating what Jesus is saying. And the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. These are the kings of the Gentile nations, right? Uh, this is uh, corresponding with Isaiah 60. Nations will come to your light, verse 3. And kings to the brightness of your rising. Where are they going to come to? Where is the light? Jerusalem, which will illuminate the entire earth. Right? The reason why uh, the significance of the city having no need of the sun or the moon is because in Deuteronomy, right, it says the nations worship the sun and the moon. But the nations, the Gentiles will realize that God is the source of light and God's lamp is the lamb who gives understanding to those who are in darkness. Right? So now we might have a better understanding of what Jesus is talking about here when he's speaking to Israel concerning his holy city and then being the salt and light of the earth. Thank you.